Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation, coming to you from Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy, Town Meeting TV here in Burlington, Vermont. We are still going through COVID time. We are uh, remote from each other, but close in our, our desire, our, our aim to get the message out about a nuclear free future. So uh, the title of our program is 76 years of, of nuclear fallout since from Hiroshima to today. So we're coming up to the 76th commemoration of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945 and following August 9th, Nagasaki. So welcome to my returning guests from the 75th year that we commemorated last year, Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear, Nuclear Waste Specialist. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you so much for returning. Thanks for having me, Margaret. Um, and Alfred Meyer from Physicians for Social Responsibility. Thank you so much for returning, Alfred. It's my it, great pleasure to be with all of you. It's a pleasure to see you today. And that's a word, words are so strange, you know, to use a pleasure, pleasure to see you. It's, it's, uh, and also a miracle, it's a miracle what, that we can go on in any way. This, this program is going into its 15th year and it's, it's uh, with gratitude to both the, the TV station, Channel 17, Town, Town Meeting TV, Center for Media and Democracy, and to my wonderful guests, who represent the activists and the, uh, the people who are getting things done out there. That's you, Kevin Camps and, and Alfred Meyer. So we'll, let's start off with the uh, advisory that uh, Kevin Camps, you sent me just, uh, just the other day about new US Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing coming soon. And Alfred, please chime in on this because of course, it's it's a uh, a vital uh, issue for physicians for social responsibility also. So, Kevin, tell us what's what's happening. Something is imminent, and something's happening soon. Yes, um, our coalition the other day put out this media advisory about the imminence of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing a high-level radioactive waste dump in Texas, but right on the border with New Mexico. So what's happening is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff is about to publish the final environmental impact statement and the final safety evaluation report for what's called interim storage partners, consolidated interim storage facility. And a, Ver a Vermont connection is that the same companies uh, that want to open this high level waste dump in Texas are the same companies that are decommissioning Vermont Yankee. So up in Vermont, they call themselves North Star. Down in Texas, they call themselves Interim Storage Partners. And some of the companies behind these names include Waste Control Specialists, which is a national low-level radioactive waste dump at the same location. And um, another company is called Orano, which used to be called Ariva, which was called Kojima before that. And this is a French nuclear giant that has set up shop in the United States. So once the NRC staff publishes those documents, then the NRC chairman has indicated that the commission, the currently three directors of the agency, will act pretty quickly in approving the dump. And we're hearing that that final approval could happen in mid-September. So that media advisory was just to get the word out to reporters to watch for all these shoes about to drop, and I just wanted to add real quickly to tie it into the nuclear weapons issue that you know New Mexico, which is a majority minority state has been targeted by the nuclear establishment for the longest uh, time in history of, of any place in the United States. It began with Los Alamos's establishment in 1943. And one of those anniversary dates that we always have to keep in mind in addition to Hiroshima and Nagasaki is Trinity the first atomic blast in world history, which took place on July 16th of 1945. It was a practice run for what would follow in Nagasaki because they were identical bombs. They were plutonium designs. 
They needed to be tested at first because they were so complex to make sure they'd work. Um, the Hiroshima bomb, a uranium bomb, was so straightforward that they knew that it would work and they didn't even test it. But ironically enough, there's more than one July 16th in New Mexico. There's also the Church Rock uranium tailing spill, which took place in 1979 in Northwest New Mexico, one of the worst radiological releases into the environment in US history. And just downstream is a Navajo Diné community. And that's their sole source of drinking water, irrigation water for their uh, flocks of sheep. And then just to, to finish on July 16th of 2018, in its ghoulish tone deafness, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission announced the beginning of the licensing for not the Texas dump, but a sister dump in New Mexico, just 40 miles from the Texas dump. That's called Holtec. And between the two consolidated interim storage facilities, a grand total of more than 200,000 metric tons of high level radioactive waste would probably get stuck there permanently. And that's more than twice what exists already in this country. Well, this is ast astounding information. And Alfred, could you come in on with the positions for social responsibility and where you, your organization is? on this issue. Yes, I will, but I, I wanna start out following up with uh, Kevin's <clears throat> uh, framing of this uh, discussion. And so this isn't actually a formal PSR position, but then I'll get around to why our organization feels that the health implications, and these we're talking about long-term, you know, 12,000 generation long impacts on all living things on the face of the earth. So this is, this is why nuclear weapons, nuclear waste, and nuclear pollution are unique uh, in, in the threats to our existence on Earth. And even if a bomb were never ever used, only just to possess them harms those that harms us who do possess them. And, um, but, but to pick up from where Kevin was talking about with the interim waste store, um, th th it makes you realize that uh, looking at these corporations is a good thing to do because it's a huge, vast industry, which was constructed in the 1942 onwards in great secrecy because it was such a top level military secret. Everything was siloed. So there's so many uh, facilities around the country were open, but nobody knew how they all linked together except for very few people. And uh, vast amounts of money were put into it and it created an industry in the 40s, the same size as the then automobile industry. And I think with automobiles, we appreciate that, you know, a car is so many things. It's, it's the seats you sit in and the steering wheel and the handles and the knobs of the radio and the, you know, so on and so forth, it's, it's vast. And that's what we're up against. Or, or that's what's going on. And, and their Achilles heel has always been waste. And their purported, uh, the, the actual, I, I think you could make an argument, uh, Kevin, tell me if you would disagree with this, but the 1982 Nuclear Waste Policy Act actually set up a fairly scientifically sound process for choosing a location for a deep geologic repository and um, looking primarily at granite formations around the country, some salt formations, but, um, and it was to have one in the east side of the country, one in the west side of the country, actually most of the uh, irradiated so-called spent nuclear fuel is uh, in the east coast. But anyway, um, this was short-circuited in 1987 with an amendment to that act, which just in Congress's wisdom, uh, Nevada at the time being a quite weak state politically and, and very few people living in it, uh, they chose Yucca Mountain, which is made out of soft, porous, volcanic material, uh, located in an area of seismic and volcanic activity. And wouldn't you know, it happens to be over a very important aquifer, a source of drinking water for agricultural people, animals. This is what was chosen. And one of the reasons it is a failed project and uh, dead is that um, it was, a, you know, not a sound process. And um, 
but, the, but getting rid of the waste is, is so critical. Um, not far in my background here in Maine, uh, about oh, eight miles as the crow flies over in Wiscasset, Maine, uh, are 56 casks of uh, high level nuclear fuel at the uh, Maine Yankee. Uh, so this is an, uh, a significant problem. My uh, particular viewpoint is that um, the point of the whole nuclear enterprise uh, is to make nuclear weapons. And when we're talking about commemorating Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the horror that was wreaked upon uh, humanity by that, uh, by the United States of America, um, that, uh, you know, that's the point of this whole endeavor and that the nuclear power is really just a cover story for the weapons. It, it is a product, a byproduct of, no, I'll say a product of the 1953 Eisenhower uh, Adams for Peace program, which was an endeavor to put a happy, smiley face on the, the horror that the atom represented through the bombings. And uh, we actually, our government, uh, set up nuclear programs around the world in, in tens of countries, um, you know, spread nuclear knowledge and, and this vast promise of, uh, you know, uh, electricity too cheap to meter. Um, but anyway, for, for, for PSR, and then let me just round out here for the moment, uh, PSR um, realizes that the nuclear fuel chain is horrifically polluting and damaging to people all along its many steps. It's it, like fossil fuels is an extractive industry. An extractive industry requires a sacrifice of people and places. Kevin mentioned the Diné at Church Rock. Uh, so many of the uranium mines are in Diné land. These are like 15,000 or so just abandoned holes in the ground with huge piles of radioactive dust out back from where the people live. Uh, it, it's a horrific story. But um, I think we need to really work to uh, make sure there's no money for nuclear power in uh, the upcoming infrastructure and uh, jobs bills. That, um, that this is a completely misguided effort. It actually obstructs and prevents us from moving to the an upgraded, different uh, design electrical system. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfred. And, but Kevin, could you go back to what, what Alfred just mentioned, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act? And and what, what strikes me very, as we're talking right now is how we can't unravel the past, that once something is done, that there's no going back to fix it. But could you address the, what, the, what happened with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act? No, Alfred's description was spot on. I mean, there were supposed to be two dumps in this country, one in the East, one in the West. And indeed, 90% um, of the waste is in the Eastern half of the country, 75% East of the Mississippi. And so the states that were being looked at in the 1980s, the early to mid 1980s included Sebago Lake in Maine, a couple sites in New Hampshire, seven sites in Vermont. This was granite formations and other states being looked at in the East included Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota. And through raw politics, those more populous, more politically powerful Eastern states said, um, no thanks, not us. And they actually got instituted into law that granite could not be looked at anymore, even though it's probably the best geologic medium for this purpose. And so the Western states that were left were Texas and Death Smith County, uh, Washington State near the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and Yucca Mountain, Nevada, which is Western Shoshone Indian land. And Washington State and Texas were powerful states. In fact, between them, they shared the House Majority Leader and the Speaker of the House at the time and had so many more members in the US House of Representatives. And so um, kind of long story short, they messed with the wrong rookie Senator when they passed what's become known as the Screw Nevada Bill. His name is Harry Reid and he's still with us. He became um, Democratic Leader of the Senate 
And the good news in a lot of ways uh, is that Nevada fought off the Yucca Mountain dump for the past 33 years. And they had a lot of help. Uh, I mentioned the Western Shoshone. They've been engaged in the battle the whole time. They do not consent. The state of Nevada does not consent. And they've been joined by more than a thousand environmental groups over that past 33 years. And that dump has been stopped dead in its tracks. Ironically enough, the consolidated interim storage facilities and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission still assume that Yucca Mountain is going to be the dump site. That's how they get away with calling their schemes interim because it's only gonna be there for 40, maybe hundred years, then it's gonna to go to Yucca. Well, it's not going to go to Yucca. <laughs> And even the Biden administration recognizes that yucca is not going to happen. So it's just um, dilemmas and confusion and deception. And, and to bring it to the present, just last week, the Texas state legislature Democrats, more than 60 of them said, we do not consent to this dump in Texas. Governor Abbott, who's a very conservative Republican to put it politely, has said he does not consent. Texas does not consent to the dump targeted at it. New Mexico, which is largely Democrat in terms of elected officials at this point, has said they do not consent. So the energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm, Granholm a former governor of Michigan, a former attorney general of Michigan, is talking about consent-based siting for consolidated interim storage facilities. Well, if, if she's being sincere, then these sites in Texas and New Mexico and Nevada have to all be taken off the table because they do not consent. That's where we're at, right where we were in 1957 when the first commercial irradiated nuclear fuel was generated at Shipping Port, Pennsylvania. We do not have an answer to this very serious high-risk problem that will last forever. So we're kind of in a pickle and we need to stop making it. We need to shut the reactors down like the people of Vermont demanded at Vermont Yankee. And one part of the good news of that is that no more high level radioactive waste for which we have no answer uh, will be generated anymore. That's what we need to do. Right. But Kevin, bringing up again, the, the decision that's, go it is a decision that's going to be made in, in the very near future by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, what is your fear of, of that? What, what is the main, and what is your prediction of what's going to happen? Well, as with Yucca Mountain, um, and as with previous consolidated interim storage facilities, like the one that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission actually licensed at the Skull Valley Goshutes Indian Reservation in Utah, we will not stop fighting. Even though they licensed Skull Valley for uh, one of these parking lot surface storage dumps, they never got away with it. The state of Utah rose up and put a stop to it uh, with allies across the country along the transportation routes. We will do the same. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is a rubber stamp agency. They do whatever the industry asks of them or tells them to do, and they do it um, consistently. So we knew from the start several years ago that the NRC would license these facilities despite it all. And um, so we have prepared, we are ready to go to court as soon as these licenses are granted. We already have our paperwork filed with the second highest court in the land, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. And we will fight tooth and nail in the courts. We will fight uh, tooth and nail in the streets and along the transportation routes. And we will stop these dumps come hell or high water. But that leaves us with the dilemma that Alfred mentioned that there is high level radioactive waste around this country on the sea coasts with rising sea levels and ever more extreme hurricanes and winter storms. There's high level radioactive waste 40 miles from where I sit on the shoreline of Lake Michigan. And you name the river, you name uh, the, the ecosystem in this country that is being put at risk by high level radioactive waste that we have to figure out how to safeguard, how to secure, how to isolate from the living environment for at least a million years into the future. That is the curse on all future generations that nuclear power has brought to us. But as I say, I'm suggesting that you could add to that very eloquent description, Kevin, that that's in pursuit of nuclear weapons. That it, it's, uh, as our 
uh, dear friend, Mr. Keegan says, um, you know, electricity is an incidental byproduct of the actual endeavor. <clears throat> and the uh, Atlantic Council, uh, which is a very uh, top flight, you know, mainstream think tank in Washington, DC, has quite a number of reports on the connection between nuclear power and national security. And in one of them, they give a, a figure of $42.8 billion that the commercial nuclear industry assists the weapons production industry with, or, or enterprise. They actually call it the enterprise. And uh, in 2017, ex-Secretary uh, of Energy Ernest Moniz published a report uh, that talked about how uh, nuclear power is an essential enabler of national security. And he talks about how many uh, companies directly affiliated with weapons production you know, of, of um, nuclear power, but it, that all ties into the weapons, you know, are located in which states. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a vast industry. But, and if I also, if I could uh, just chime in on your use of the royal we, Kevin, that I, I really would invite all the viewers out there to join us. Um, Kevin's organization is beyondnuclear.org. Um, my organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility, is psr.org. If you go to those websites, you'll find a, a vast trove of uh, latest news items, uh, background uh, papers and histories and things, also opportunities to take action, to uh, learn more. And it, it's really important that all of us uh, really take part in this because the, the, the regulatory industry is, is not regulating. It's, it's not looking after us uh, in any way, shape, or form. We're in great danger. Uh, to, to move this stuff twice uh, is twice as bad. Uh, that presumes that there would be an interim and a final storage. But as Kevin noted, the most likely outcome is that um, the interim will ipso facto become permanent because it won't have any place to go. And, and meanwhile, um, you know, all of us should pay attention to any decommissioning efforts around uh, where you live, because this is a quite uh, new and uh, wild west territory of actions. And Kevin mentioned the financial kind of vertical integration of this industry of, of just moving this terribly dangerous stuff you know, dumping it on somebody's land someplace and, and saying that that finishes the job. And it does not at all. This stuff uh, is, is we've made a, in a, a sense, a little bit of the sun here on earth, and we know not what to do with it. And as Kevin said, stop making more, number one. And then we should really devote these huge resources uh, that, that currently are going into weapons programs and put them into cleanup and environmental programs. So let your elected officials know and take part in, you know, local organizations, but, but please feel free to contact either the Physicians for Social Responsibility or Beyond Nuclear. And it's, it's a very human thing to want to get rid of what is plaguing you around your house, right? Like if the, the, uh, the issue here of putting the Vermont Yankee nuclear waste onto what Kevin Kevin has described in, on other programs here and on the on Beyond Nuclear website, on on trains, on 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 uh, on, on on trucks, on ships, and mm -hmm. and transporting this very high level waste and low level waste also out west, to, just to get it out of here. And there are many people who uh, who just want that, even if they were activists. In the in shutting down Vermont Yankee, it's just get it get it out now. Well, we're and, used to, we're used to the idea of you, you throw away trash, you know, and, and maybe a truck comes and picks it up in your neighborhood and and it's gone. Um, but this stuff never goes. There is no way you can't throw it away. It, it's it's uh, you know the, the the misleading term of spent nuclear fuel, the the fuel rods that have been fissioned for a couple of years or so. Um, spent. It's, it's like your gas in your car. You, you put gas in the tank, you drive around for a while, then it's empty. You need to put more in. That's, you know, the gas is spent. But with re, uh, nuclear fuel, those irradiated 
fuel rods are horrifically hot in both temperature and radiation and will be for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, even some uh, of the isotopes, tens of millions of years, the half-life. You know, I mean, it's, it's, this is such a preposterous endeavor and it's been uh, the centerpiece of our nation's security uh, pro-planning, you know, and the nuclear threat and the so-called deterrence and um, we drive, I mean, I'm no fan of the North Korean government and its leaders, but to me, after George W. Bush identified North Korea as one of the three parts of the axis of evil, and we invaded Iraq, so I guess we kind of mean what we're saying, you know, the, the fact that they would develop nuclear weapons as a defensive measure. I mean, we're just upping the ante at a time when our conventional forces are bigger than anything else on the world. And, but of course, we have military bases spread vastly throughout the world. I, I forget the number of hundreds of bases, foreign bases uh, loaded with our troops. And Kevin, can you, uh, the, the START Treaty comes to mind, the strategic, would you talk about the START Treaty, which, which just uh, uh, stopped in February, right, of 2021. What, what is, what's going on with that? Right, a lot of treaties about nuclear weapons between the United States and the former Soviet Union, now Russia, have expired. There is some hope that Biden and Putin may sit down like Reagan and Gorbachev did decades ago and um, restart some of these treaties back up. Uh, a very hopeful treaty, and this is the, the global uh, grassroots, essentially, the uh, anti-nuclear weapons groups, the anti-proliferation groups, the Hibakusha, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the downwinders, including in New Mexico, but also Nevada, Utah, and so many other places in this country alone, and hammered out the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons just a few years ago. And this past, uh, January 22nd, that treaty went into effect internationally because more than 50 countries had ratified it. The United States and all the other nuclear weapons powers have stood aside. They do not regard it as a law that applies to them. But it's fair to say now, just like with chemical weapons, biological weapons, landmines, these weapon systems that are unacceptable in a civilized world, nuclear weapons are now regarded that way under binding international law as well. So if the United States wants to be a rogue country and behave as an international outlaw in the eyes of the world, I guess that's its choice. But we really need to um, sober up, wake up, and join the world community before it's too late. And I'll quote Henry Kissinger on this one, you know, the man who built his entire career based on the power of nuclear weapons, ultimately, and the conventional military that Alfred mentioned. He, in 2007, was joined by a number of others, um, a bipartisan group that got, became referred to as the four horsemen of the nuclear apocalypse, to say that we need to abolish our nuclear weapons. The United States needs to abolish its nuclear weapons to set an example for the rest of the world because the only existential threat that the United States faces is nuclear weaponry aimed at it by countries like Russia. So I'll take it from Henry Kissinger on that one. Uh, we had better abolish nuclear weapons before they abolish us as a species and as a planet. And as a little backstory about that uh, United Nations treaty, the prohibition, the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and I wanna share this again with the viewers to encourage them to you know, join, join this effort. Uh, this whole concept actually came up with, from a small group meeting, mostly women actually, and, and one Australian uh, male physician. And they came up with the concept of not going the typical nuclear pathways of the United Nations because that would go through the Security Council and the Security Council its five permanent members with veto power are, guess what? Nuclear weapon states. So even at the UN, you know, this uh, committee, which has unusual, extraordinary world uh, decision-making power is, you know, permanently headed by nuclear weapons armed countries. So this effort 
uh, instead went to the General Assembly. And, and, and as it, to me, it feels like democracy broke out at the United Nations because all, it's all the small countries that have no nuclear power or nuclear weapons programs whatsoever. They're the ones that are gonna suffer from the uh, famine created by the nuclear winter should some small conflagration take place with nuclear weapons. And so it was all the kind of the common people, the, the ordinary countries, the 122 or so that signed it, um, uh, you know, that the, they were able to make this move forward. And, and at the time of it moving forward, wouldn't you know, the United Nations UN ambassador, the uh, French UN ambassador and the United Kingdom's UN ambassadors all held a press conference denouncing this treaty, that, that this would impair the great progress towards uh, disarmament that they were making under the current uh, setup. And, and I just I hasten to note that that great progress is a complete rebuilding and re of the nuclear weapons complex across this country and across the world and making whole new families and, of nuclear weapons. So, you know, it's the wrong direction. This, uh, again, I, I think we're at a time in history where uh, democracy could well be our, the answer to our problems and it's uh, gravely endangered. Well, time is, is running out for our short program and I'm so grateful that you came again to us. Well, let, let's, let's stop with your hopes and fears. If, if you would tell us what your, your hope is and what your, your fear is, or maybe to, to reverse that, the fear, what is your fear first and then your hope? And then we'll we'll end with that with gratitude. So, Kevin, well, um, yeah, I, I'm reminded when you mentioned fear. Uh, Martin Luther King gave a powerful sermon in Detroit in the early 1960s, and I just happened to get a hold of an audio cassette copy of it when I visited the church. They have a Swords and the Plowshares Peace Center there, and they had the audio cassettes for sale, and. Um, what he pointed out is that there is paralyzing fear and there's healthy fear. Paralyzing fear, um, living in an urban downtown and you're afraid to be attacked by a cobra that probably is not in your apartment. That's a paralyzing fear that is unreasonable, not rational. But healthy fear exists to keep us safe and to keep us healthy, to keep us away from danger. So it's certainly reasonable and rational to be afraid of nuclear weapons um, and nuclear power and radioactive waste. They are deadly and hazardous. So that's kind of what fuels our anti-nuclear activism is having this healthy fear and taking action about it. And that's where the hope comes from is taking the action. And so the hope is that like Alfred just mentioned, this $1.7 trillion nuclear renovation plan in the United States, which is really a nuclear, nuclear weapons expansion plan mm. can be stopped uh, dead in its tracks. Um, the same on the nuclear power side of the coin where um, just as we speak, at least tens of billions of dollars, if not hundreds of billions of dollars could be thrown at the nuclear power industry for both new and old reactors we, we need to stop that in Congress. We need to stop that with the Biden administration, but it's gonna take a lot of work because the nuclear industry, it's, its lobby is so powerful. They really have their claws into this country politically, economically. So those are the hopes and fears that we live with and work with every day. And um, before I close, I just wanna encourage folks to go to our websites and there you will find on the Beyond Nuclear website under the nuclear weapons tab, is a listing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki commemorations around the country and around the world. So find one near you. If there isn't one near you, uh, organize one. There's still some time to organize, you know, a simple candlelight vigil on August 6th and August 9th and or invite some speakers and uh, commemorate uh, these important um, annual um, markings of these hor horrific nuclear attacks by the United States on Japan. And I know PSR also has a Hiroshima Nagasaki um, events listing too.
Thank you, Kevin. Alfred, closing words, please. Yes, well, uh, physician social responsibility recognizes two existential threats to life as we know it on Earth. One of them is nuclear catastrophe, the other is climate catastrophe. And uh, I would suggest we're on thin ice in both uh, regards. So I would say that my fear is that um, there will be some experience or multiple experiences of such catastrophes taking place. I mean, we see in China just a couple of weeks ago, a rainstorm which dumped eight inches of water in one hour. Eight inches of water in one hour that flooded the tunnels, the subways, you know, caused you know, untold damage and death. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the new normal. And uh, the, the heat waves, uh, you know, Portland, Oregon, uh, 116 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, not, not the town I knew. But um, so, so my fear is, you know, that, that there'll be a, a ecological and or, I mean, a, a nuclear catastrophe leads to an ecological catastrophe. But anyway, that's my worry. My great hope, and, and Margaret, I wanna thank you for having a show like this and getting this word out to people because my great hope uh, is working together with other people to take action to solve these problems and that we will realize that in fact, we are one world, that the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, the uh, you know, chemical releases that we put into the environment affect all of us and that we need to work and cooperate together. There are so many different ways we can do things. We need to make quick, radical transformation we, we have less than 10 years to address the climate catastrophe. Like Greta Turnberry says, our house is on fire. You know, we need to do something and, and there are things to do. But um, I, I'll just uh, second what Kevin said. Uh, sometimes when people learn the field I work in, they say, oh my, aren't you really depressed all the time? I mean, th these are such overwhelming uh, issues. And my ready, happy answer always is let me tell you about the fine people I work with on these issues, such as Kevin, such as yourself, Margaret. Um, that, and and this, this is our hope and salvation and it's, uh, it can be done, but we need to do it. So go to PSR.org. PSR has chapters uh, around the country and, and if uh, you don't find one near you, contact the office and we'll get in touch with you. Thank you so much, Kevin Kemps and, and, and Alfred Meyer. Thank Margaret, you so much. Could I, I was remiss not to mention that there's a Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Community Advisory Panel meeting on September 20th from 6 to 9 p.m. And it's supposed to take place in person, but also I believe you can plug in remotely. So Vermonters, please get involved with that and um, speak your piece. Um, there are huge issues of environmental justice at stake in terms of both the low and high level waste that's being talked about there. So um, I encourage people on September 20th, if you can plug into that meeting, six to 9 p.m., the Nuclear Decommissioning Community Advisory Panel. Okay, thank you. And we will be there, Vermont will be there. And thank you so much, both of you. Till next time and take care. Thank, thank you, you Channel 17. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Alfred. Goodbye for now. Yeah. Bye-bye.